CAA have released a well-worded, clear and concise document in which they have clarified the role and responsibility local authorities or councils in the UK can take when attempting to restrict flight over their land. Stay tuned for a full explanation. Hey everyone, my name is Sean and welcome to Geeks Varna. Today is the first of two videos looking at the new policy document released by the CAA, CAP 722C. This complements the full CAP 722, which outlines the adoption of the EASA drone regulations in the UK from January 2021. For more on this general topic, there is a link in the description to our new UK drone rules playlist. To get the next video regarding CAP 722C and future videos in our UK drone rules series, hit subscribe. Today, we are focusing on the implications that the policy outlined in 722C has for drone flyers and local authorities. I'm joined by friend of the channel, Andrew McQuillan from Crown space drones who amongst other roles carry out public safety services so they have direct experience of the policy being set out. Let's join our conversation now. Also please let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on this and how it could impact your own drone flights. Okay so, so today we're going to be looking at the CAP 722C in, in the specific area of local authorities and how this will affect um, your, your average especially hobbyist um, um, UAS flyer, drone flyer. Um, and I, I, I think the language here has clarified things um, from the point of view of whether or not, of course, local authorities can charge to fly over land and whether or not they can stop you flying over their land as well, of course, uh, which I think is very healthy. It, it, it's a very well-written document, isn't it? It's taken a long time to get to where it is. I mean, this is not a problem that is caused by the European regulations uh, coming in or caused by anything recent. This has been a long-standing issue for a lot of drone flyers in the UK. So it's been a source of complaint to DFT and the CEA. Um, the problem has been previously, where does that land? And the, 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 the first key point about this is somebody has taken ownership of this, and that is the CEA drone unit. Yes. Because previously it was not them. This was an airspace issue. So it was that fight between DFT in the one hand and CA airspace team. So the, the key problem here is that they've got conflicting roles in that. So the drone unit want to promote drone use and things like that. The airspace operations team are there to follow procedures in terms of managing airspace. There was no rule set in stone that you could not charge. There was a proviso that access to a state asset is not charged for, but at the same time you're charged a fee for your drone, etc., etc. So there was go it was going down, you know, a very blurred line. So yes. the first thing is that somebody has taken responsibility, and that is now de designated for the most part as the drone unit. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to read out the 4.3 part here for the audience, which I'll also be showing on screen. So it says, local authority restrictions. Any restriction on the operation of UAS whilst airborne must be carried out using an airspace restriction, as summarised in this document and set out in these uh, documents, those documents referenced throughout. The establishment of an airspace restriction means that the sponsor is responsible for managing it and not that the sponsor owns it. Uh, airspace is a state asset, as you were just saying. Local authorities, like any landowner, may use usually only impose restrictions on the taking off or landing of UAS from their land, usually through bylaws. Now that 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 is interesting because as 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 you say, that is the CAA drone unit stepping forward and saying, okay, we're we're actually going to be very very clear with our wording because i think if you look at things like um our recent video on what is a congested area um there there, there are those parts of regulation which just because of the way that the, the, the british law works uk law works has to work has to be a little bit amb ambiguous until yeah, cases, but, uh, cases actually happen so. in their navigation order the only way to get a definition is to challenge it in court exactly because it does provide a definition this is not a legal issue this is a, um, a charging issue for airspace. That is not covered by their navigation order. There's a general principle around the world that access to airspace is free. Yes. And the problem has been um, with, with restricted airspace in airports and things, it's been private companies primarily are the ones that are trying to charge and have been charging. Um, whereas whenever you're getting to local authorities, local authorities remit from government is to recoup the money they incur to deliver public services through whatever means that is not just taxation therefore local authorities have been charging on the management time of having to do this it's not that they're trying to penalize drone users but they no, were seeking to recover their costs in full yes now what the great thing about this is it's saying that the local authorities need to drop overflight now 
they may still have a role. If you're taking off in their land, obviously they're definitely still a role. But if you're taking off in their land, flying over their land, over their land or town centres, they've still got a role to play in that. But it's saying that for the overflight, you can't charge. Yes, indeed, and, and that's and that's going to help. Obviously, when 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 we move forward into the new regulations, that will help people with A2 CFCs, hobbyists with sub two hundred and fifty gram drones, because of course we're not going to be getting into that constant argument with some local authorities uh, where they feel that because they've got a, a no takeoff um, um, uh, bylaw or stipulation, then actually they yeah, well, they, the, they the step thing with this airspace. document says you can ignore them. Yes. So this document says if a local authority tells you to seek an application or to uh, pay money for flying over council land or public land, you do not need to even engage with them, essentially. Yes, indeed, exactly. So this... You may wish to for safety reasons. Yes, yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> you know, category don't, just ignore them. Yeah, but and... for the point of view of them charging or seeking to have an application to fly there, yes, unless there's a form of airspace restriction, as it says, you do not need to seek anyone's permission to do that. Exactly, which is which is absolutely. You think it's just fantastic. that takeoff and land, as you were correctly said. Completely, listen. Everyone needs to really separate out in their heads. Take off and landing on the land still needs permission from the council, but it's once you're in flight you know above a reasonable distance nothing to do with it yes exactly and um 4.3.1 which is the information for uas operators which again is on screen here for the viewers uh, uas operators must fully consider any other uh, applicable re uh, restrictions and legitimate interests of other statutory bodies such as local authorities many of which have established local bylaws these bylaws often restrict the taking off landing of UAS from council land, such as a restriction on its own um, is, is not an airspace restriction, is therefore not considered a UAS geographical zone. And that UAS geographical zone, I, I think, is, again, very clever because it's very precise language. And we are saying this is a UAS ge uh, geographical zone. So it's, it's it's very clear to everyone that you, you've either got this or you haven't, frankly. And to, to, to of course, to get it, they have to... Um... I agree it's better to have that sort of tarot. My concern is actually from a manned aviation perspective, we're trying to change a very established system for them. I agree that the document says they're trying to not, and they're trying to use the existing systems. But adding a, different, a geographic zone for UAS that's going to have to be translated into manned aviation speak more so. The second paragraph um, of, of the 4.3.1, which is the information for UAS operators, uh, states it is important to distinguish between the permission uh, required to operate from council land and the permission required to operate in certain portions of airspace. Um, and the, the paragraph then obviously talks about the fact that you know, even if you do have permission from obviously a local authority, you still have to make sure the airspace is clear. And 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 I think it's 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 nice as well because the document is is very much creating a, a, a separation between local authority and air regulator. Um, and I think that's a very healthy thing. They're saying the two things are separate entities. When you go to the local authority, you're talking about permission to take off and land using their land not their airspace essentially um and, and, and the two things should that be treated in terms of that because look at what happens in america with every mm. state and every sort of city level looking to regulate their own airspace and the fa says it's federal but still people ignore them yes so the, the key thing is we, we don't have that big a problem with this but it solves it for the minority of what cases where we do i mean i'm aware of less than 12 councils that are trying to overreach where this now cuts them off yes um, but those are some of those are quite profile high profile councils um and it's part of so it another project we're doing in terms of educating councils around the uk and on drone laws um, I, I think one of the key things people need to realize as well is just councils or local authorities may end up having restrictions put in place for certain reasons it's not going to be oh, the, their entire council area but it could be We've got an event on, we've got to the high, high priority. Some councils have been able to achieve that for coronavirus testing stations and other things, okay. and our, um, yeah. other sites for coronavirus. So you know, it's not just a case of this exempts you from any council-led restriction. There may be a lawful restriction on behalf of that council in place. Yes. Yes. That does not guarantee you can just go into that area. Would that, would that be set up as a... Would that, would that mean that they would have to have a UAS ge geographical zone, or is that... Or is that something well, under, else under the new, they're going to have to have a geographical zone set out in terms of that restriction. It may be a full restricted airspace because it may be manned as well, banned or not banned, but, but too restricted. But we're, but we're still talking. Um, we're still talking a no tam essentially. So we're still talking something if we're if we're well, doing. Well, a, a no tam will notify you exists. So yes. and the various mapping tools will tell you about Absolutely. that, like a drone assist app. A no tam is, is is still just going to tell you it's there rather than that's not the, the restriction. But we need to see how that because it could be that 
it talks about this sort of fit into the existing structures. So the existing structures are restriction of airspace temporary. We commonly call those RATs, R-A-T's. Um, so if you've got a RAT in place, it could cover all manned aircraft, it may not. And they're talking in this document about using the existing article um, for that you know, to be enacted because yes. those all have to be signed off by the Secretary of State. There's a significant process to that. It's interesting because it actually enshrines in policy that 90 day process there was an unofficial 90-day requirement of notice for that, and now that's enshrined in this document as processing time. Excellent. So it, it's not simple to get these. You can get them emergency ones, but that's because an incident's happened or something major's happened or there's yes, a royal family yes. member movement, but, but we But we, we, we're not going to see a situation where you know uh, local authorities are going to start having UAS geographical zones spring up just because they've got a park in the area or something. Or you know, no, the, um, the document talks about the reasons why you can get one. And realistically, most of these end up being backed by the police, and the police do not do that for you know, invalid reasons. Absolutely. So I, I think that you have to trust the process. It's really restrictive at the moment. It's loosened a bit because some things that do need to be covered weren't, and it's sort of getting to, it's it's becoming more fit for purpose. Um, for example, it talks about covering events now, um, because under the new regulations, you may see a drop away of the one hundred and fifty from crowds rule for all drones. Um, so you, and if you do that, you also need to protect the people who are at risk still because yes. there's not the risk isn't reduced um so I, I think the key thing is that this is allowing more flexible mans of diverse space the geographic zones are it's going to help with utm i mean what people need to realize is this is all a part of the journey to get to um unified or unmanned traffic or whatever you want to call it and involve it in that the next stage in that journey after this is remote id yes whether people like it or not um and that is to get us to utm utm is not because amazon want to come fly drones or dhl want to come fly drones to deliver that's because there will be a growing use of drones it's not because big players want certain things we are on a natural progression to that point. It's absolutely. the same way whenever the Wright brothers happened, and then yeah, you know, yeah. we, got, we got commercial aviation, Ab things changed massively absolutely. in between Ab those periods. There will always be access to airspace in the UK to fly. It doesn't mean it'll be the most convenient to you. Yes. It doesn't mean it'll be perfectly outside your house or in the park across the road, but there will always be access. This is enshrining that everyone will be guaranteed airspace access. You can't control the risks of who's flying around you or what's flying around you. So the key thing is it's saying you need to be flexible. You may need to go to you may need to go to the airspace, um, you know, to do that. And you know, it's the same as if you're if you're going to be doing a long distance journey up the M six or M one. Mm. You know, if that route's congested, you need you might want to go around it for your yeah. own convenience. Yeah, it's the same thing with airspace. You'll want to go the own route and get your own place where you know are happy. The more rural, quite frankly, the better because it'll free it up a lot more. It's the same with Class G airspace. Mostly yes. Class G is going to be a lot easier to work in for drones. But it's just about finding that right place you want to fly or multiple places. No one's saying exactly. you can geographically locked. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, people need to be more flexible in their thinking going forward. It's not just, I've always flown here, it's blah, blah, blah. And then the final section regarding local authorities is the 4.3.2. Uh, which talks about whilst bylaws may exist which protect council land and those using it, these are not UAS uh, geographical zones and the management of this airspace is only possible following the establishment of an appropriate airspace structure in accordance with the documents referenced throughout CAP 722C. The airspace remains a state asset and is managed by the sponsor. Uh, as such, the details of these bylaws will not be proclamated uh, within the AIP and will therefore not be displayed on online charts or apps. If councils deem a UAS geographical zone is required in addition to any bylaws, um, then they should follow the guidance within this document and the relevant reference documents. And then it talks about when they're issuing it etc which I'll, I'll i'll leave the audience to uh to read on but again it's very very clear language and this is actually one of the documents i'm probably going to have printed off in my drone bag <laughs> for when i do fly in these kind of areas frankly because uh, it's it's simple language that you can show a police officer that you can show um a ranger uh, um you know a, a local authority uh worker etc anybody that, that approaches you that has authority um on on that land of course if you're stood in the middle of council land then you know it's up to them what, what what they allow you to do of course um but if you're flying over um without without actually being on their land then this this does give you the perfect um reference point which isn't you know 0. 0.177 of xyz from 1972 says generally yeah. you know this is very specific so i so, so I, I i think this 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 could be a good document for for people to have with them
to play devil's advocate there, um, I would say if you're on council land, it's going to be like a park ranger, etc. It's going to depend on their training and that sort of like to yes. Hopefully, that's going to be quite good in terms of their understanding based on another project we're doing. Um, however, it's not. It's, this is a guidance document for the CA. It's not legislation. They're not saying this is all in law. This yes. is their policy. This yes, is their, what they do. So a park ranger may go, that's not law, it's policy, therefore I'm ignoring that. I'm not saying that's the right thing, of course, of the action no, for him or her No, take. but, but you, you have to be ready. You have to be the ready The worst thing that. people could do is go looking for a bun fight whenever yes. they do get approached. Yes. This and should not. This should give you confidence in your approach, but doesn't mean you should end up with a conflict situation because then you may get banned from the park or whatever. Indeed. So you know that, that's the key thing to bear in mind. This is not a you know or, get a or banned from an entire local authority where you live, which wouldn't be good. Well, if you're flying in a park on Monday to Friday nine to five, and you do or anywhere, and you get approached by police, I would point out that this sort of document refers to the fact that you can call the drone unit. Now. It's not case of I've got the drone unit for you here, officer, speak to them. Yes. But you can empower them to phone them because there is a process in place for them to contact them or their own drone unit. Obviously, that's a Monday to Friday nine to five service. So if you're on a Saturday night, etc., it's going to be a lot harder to do that. Indeed. But if you do if you're if you do have problems during that Monday to Friday nine to five, you can call the drone unit. Now, it doesn't mean the police officer will have to speak to them, but you know. Also, you can empower the, the police officer say, here's the drone unit. You can verify that internally or online. Yes, but to, to, to summarise in, in terms of local authorities, uh, the CAP 722C um, is, is essentially is, is clarifying the policy from the point of view that, um, yes, the local authorities, of course, have control of who takes off and lands, which, of course, is the same as any landowner. You know, if, if, if I owned a field, then, then I, I, have that, I have that right. I have those rights as a landowner as well, of course. Um, and that if, if they want to... Um, uh, uh, restrict air flight then just like anybody else they're going to need to get a, a UAS geographical zone established and they're going to have to have reasons laid out in this document for them to be granted one um, so it, it, it is it is something which as a policy is makes things a little bit clearer and um, certainly, um, as, as you say, prevents, I don't want to call them rogue local authorities, lo rogue councils, but, but certainly misguided local authorities that, that, that are currently going in the wrong direction. Um, it will just pull them back a little bit. Do, do, you, do you think... Interesting in that front as well as to mention, mm. they talk about local authorities in this document, but the principle of what they're saying applies to any person trying to charge or control access over their land. Exactly what I was just about to so ask. This me. is National Trust. This is English Heritage. Yes. This is anyone who doesn't have a formal airspace restriction or geographic zone put in place. Um, so this is, it's a bit sort of misleading maybe that they've said local authorities, not sort of, you know, everyone else. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. And, and, and one thing I would like to stress as well, we're talking about this from the point of view of ensuring our freedom as, as drone operators, but as, as, as is clearly stated in, in, in the paragraphs, um, especially the information for UAS operators, you still have to make sure your flight is legal. This isn't saying, hey, you can go to your local national trust site, stand just outside their land, and and go crazy. You know, you're still not you you, you you're still going to have to stick to all of the regulations that are currently in place, and then of course the new ones coming in in, in January 2021. So um, this isn't sort of a um, carte blanche, you know. And, and they the, the CAA specifically in this policy do state that the drone operator, the US UAS operator, must ensure that the airspace and all the other regulations are still followed. So you know, this isn't this isn't an excuse to go crazy, but it is clarification on something which. Um, a lot of people are concerned about and a lot of people uh, do get confused about. So there you have it, a positive and clear definition of policy from the CAA with a number of ways to get even more information, all of which ensuring that local government or any other landowner for that matter cannot attempt to restrict our use of UK airspace with blanket drone bans. The CAP 722C document is linked in the description. I recommend you take the time to read it. Coming up soon, our second video on CAP 722C takes to look at the general policy and what it means for drone flyers in the UK. Now, if you're still watching this, please consider hitting the like button. It does help the channel. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Oh, you're still here. I tell you what, while you're here, I'll, I'll tell you a joke, shall I? So I encountered a video on YouTube that said how to stop procrastinating. I thought, how handy is that? So I saved it for later. Boom, boom, See you next time.